Our loving Father, once again, we come to you, Lord, asking for your tender mercies and grace to be with us, even to be with the technology, Father, that all things would work well so that the presentation can be done in a smooth manner that will reach the hearts of your people. So abide with us once again, Lord, as we seek to unfold your words to know how you can revive us, that we may be counted amongst the faithful. Is our prayer we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, as we stated, we were looking at the fact that we know that there's a final crisis that we're getting ready to come in contact with. The Lord has shown us very clearly from his word that there is a great trial that God's people are going to face. But we also know that Jesus had a great trial and he had the victory. He faced Golgotha like a champion, but it was because of that victory he first got where? In Gethsemane. Amen. And so it is that we learned about the Gethsemane experience and how God wants us to get victory over self so that we, too, may be victorious in the final crisis. And brothers and sisters, when I use the term final crisis, I don't use that by accident because you can take the word crisis out and put test there, but it all means the same thing. What I mean by that is when you look at what inspiration says, we're told the Sabbath will be the great test of loyalty, for it is the point of truth, especially controverted. When the final test shall be brought to bear upon men, then the line of distinction will be drawn between those who serve God and those who serve him not. Now, that's actually not from Evangelism 234. That's actually from Great Controversy 605. Observe. While one class, by accepting the sign of submission to earthly powers, receives the mark of the beast, the other, choosing the token of allegiance to divine authority, receives the seal of God. And so you find that when the final test comes, when the Sunday law test comes to God's people, the reason it's called a final test is because whatever decision you and I make, that's going to be our final decision. If we have not learned to choose Jesus and his truth, come what may, by the time the Sunday law crisis comes to us, it will be too late. And as a result of that, we will find ourselves amongst those who will receive the mark of the beast. This is not the desire of God. God wants us to be counted amongst those who receive the seal of the living God. Because whatever decision we make, it's going to be our final decision. And if the individuals choose the mark of the beast, then brothers and sisters, it would be as if probation has closed on them. Because the Bible does not give a picture of individuals receiving the mark of the beast and then changing their mind later on. Do you see that in the Bible? I don't see that anywhere in the book of Revelation. Once an individual receives the mark of the beast, they have the mark of the beast. Once an individual receives the seal of the living God, they have the seal of the living God. And therefore, it's final decision time. And because of this, I believe that we can learn another lesson from the Bible. You see, the Bible shows us that there was a probationary time that was going to close upon Israel. God presented unto Israel in the book of Daniel, the ninth chapter, a probationary time frame. And I want you to go there with me, Daniel chapter 9, and we're now going to look at verse 24. In Daniel, the ninth chapter, in the 24th verse, we're going to find that God gave Israel a probationary time frame to get their act together. We're in the book of Daniel, the ninth chapter, and if you're there, please say amen. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 9, and we're going to start right there at verse 24. God presented a time frame that he was going to give Israel to get their act together. And notice how the Bible spells it out in Daniel 9 in the 24th chapter or 24th verse. And it says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. The Bible was giving a prophetic utterance showing that God said to Israel, his people, that you have a timeline of which you need to get your act together. It was called 70 weeks, 70 sevens, if you will. And of course, we know that that equals 490 days. But in the context of this prophecy, it would be 490 what? 
years. And so it is that the Bible presented a 490 year prophecy upon which Israel was supposed to get their act together, to get victory over sin. And of course, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Now the problem is, is that Israel failed. Israel failed. They did not pass the test. And the reason we know this is because notice what the Bible says in the book of Acts, the 13th chapter. In the book of Acts, the 13th chapter, let's notice what the Bible says here. Acts, the 13th chapter. And when you get there, please say amen. We're in Acts, the 13th chapter. And now we're looking at the fact that Israel unfortunately failed. They were given an opportunity. They was given an opportunity to be a blessing unto all the world and certainly unto their own people, but they did not appreciate the blessings. And the Bible spells it out in Acts, the 13th chapter. And now we are looking at verse 46. Acts 13 and verse 46, the Bible says, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. It was at this point that Israel was no longer recognized as the quote unquote chosen people of God. Israel as a nation, their probation closed. And God now had to work amongst another people upon which they are called the Gentiles so that he can give the gospel to them. They would appreciate it. And then they would go forward in giving the work of the gospel and doing the work of the gospel. Well, here it is that now we're looking at the fact that there was a probationary time period. And as Israel was drawing close to their probation being closed, the Bible shows that God wanted to do something with Israel. And I believe what God wanted to do with Israel of old is the same thing God wants to do with Israel today. Go to the book of Acts, the first chapter with me. In the book of Acts chapter one, you will find that God wanted to do something special through Israel. And this great work that God wanted to accomplish through Israel of old, God wants to accomplish through Israel today. The Bible says in the book of Acts chapter one, and when you get there, please say amen. The Bible says in Acts chapter one, and we're looking right here now at verse eight, Acts chapter one and verse eight. After Jesus, he is already uh, resurrected and now he's giving final counsel to his people. And here it is that Jesus now makes a very powerful statement unto them in Acts chapter one and verse eight. The Bible says, but ye shall receive what? But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Jesus made a promise unto his people that he said that you shall receive power. What was the purpose of receiving this power? So that they could be witnesses. God was always wanting to win souls unto himself. It was the crux. It was the climax of God's thought processes. God always wanted to win people unto himself, both from the Jew as well as the Gentile. And here it is that God chose Israel, the key ingredient that they're going to need in order to accomplish the mission. And what's the key ingredient in the verse? The key ingredient, yes, they need power, but the ingredient to make it happen is what? is the Holy Spirit. Now, why is this so necessary? Go to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3. Watch this. In 2 Timothy, the third chapter, the reason why this is so necessary is because I want you to see something here as we look at the condition of God's church even today. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and then when you get there, let me know by saying amen. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting at verse 1, I want you to notice this now. 2 Timothy, we're looking at chapter 3 and verse 1. The Bible says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unholy without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And here we find God giving a description of the condition of the world in the last days. Am I right? Is that right? Is that right? 
Are you sure? Can I, can I give you some news? I respectfully disagree with you. I do not believe that what we just read is a description of the world in the last days. You want to know why I don't believe that? Because of verse 5. What does it say in verse 5? It says, having a form of godliness. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when is the last time you looked down the streets and what's happening in the world today and saw forms of godliness? When you go down the streets in our world today, brothers and sisters, you see billboards, you see posters, and they're promoting nakedness. That is not godliness. They're promoting movies that are talking about death, murder, and killing. That's not godliness. When you go to the average bookstore today and you pick up books and they talk about novels and how Mary is sleeping with John and John is sleeping with Susan and Susan is sleeping with Tom and everybody's committing fornication, that is not godliness. When we live in a world today where homosexuality is not simply something that God calls abominable in his word, but now it is now being promoted as something that should constitute in the marriage institution. Brothers and sisters, that that is not godliness. When the world does what they do, they do it, they are sinful, and the world is bold about it. The world does not cover up their sinfulness. They are sinful and they are bold about it. But do you know a place where you can go where you can see forms of godliness? It's the church. That's why Paul says, perilous times shall come. The church is referred to as the place where God wanted his light to shine before the world. And brothers and sisters, when the church begins to lose its light, it's a perilous time. And the Bible says having a form of godliness. But what was the problem? Look at the rest of the verse now in verse five again. It says having a form of godliness, but doing what? Denying the power thereof and the Bible says from such do what turn away now I want you to catch that the Bible says from such turn away and that's exactly what people are doing right now people are tired of hypocrisy the church was supposed to be a place that the Bible says in 1 Timothy 3.15 was supposed to be the pillar and ground of truth. When people came to the church, they were supposed to see something different than what they see in the world. And when we find that now the church has become so accommodating to the world that the same music in the world is the same music in the church. The same dress in the world is the same dress in the church. The same attitudes in the world is the same attitudes in the church. Brothers and sisters, when the church becomes like that, the church is no longer converting the world, the world is now converting the church. And when a time like that comes, that's perilous times, brothers and sisters. But what's the reason that the church is in this condition? The Bible just said it. It said they have a form, but they have no power. But Jesus said in Acts 1 and verse 8, he says, when the Holy Ghost shall come, you shall receive power. Power. It is when we understand this that now we can resonate with the statements of Ellen White where she says very clearly, when she makes this statement, a revival and reformation must take place under the ministration of the Holy Spirit. There is no way that we are going to be revived, brothers and sisters, if the Holy Spirit is not integral in that work. Oh, my friends, we need to have the Spirit of God in our hearts, in our homes, in our churches, and in our lives. Because there's no other way that we can be revived and then ultimately be counted. And so it says, revival signifies a renewal of spiritual life, a quickening of the powers of mind and heart, a resurrection from the spiritual death. And I often wondered, what does spiritual death look like? What does spiritual death look like? In other words, this is not talking about literal death. This is talking about spiritual death. How can someone know if they are, quote unquote, spiritually dead? Go to the book of Ephesians chapter 2. Let's find out. The Bible says in Ephesians, the second chapter, how can I know if someone is, quote unquote, spiritually dead? Because the purpose of revival is to resurrect someone from spiritual death. So I need to know what is spiritual death. Notice what the Bible says in Ephesians, the second chapter. 
as we let the word of God interpret itself for us. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter two, right there in verse one, it's so powerful because you look at that, it actually says it. It says a revival signifies a renewal of spiritual life, a quickening of the powers of the mind and heart, a resurrection from the spiritual death. Now let's notice what the Bible says here in Ephesians chapter two and verse one. And if you're there, please say amen. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter two and verse one, it says, and you have he quickened who were dead, how? In trespasses and sins. Whenever an individual allows trespasses and sins to dominate their lives, according to the scripture, they are spiritually dead. And God wants to create a revival wherein he can once again breathe that breath of life back into our hearts that we can become quickened in mind and in heart and begin to once again love the things God loves and praise God hate the things God hates. And this is the character that God wants to develop and it cannot happen by might and it cannot happen by power. It can only happen by the indwelling presence of God's spirit. If you understand what the preacher is saying thus far, let me hear you say amen. amen. Now, I want you to turn your Bibles to the book of Joel chapter 2. The Bible tells us a nice little picture here in Joel chapter 2. And we can see how this resonates very well with Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2. Notice what the Bible says in the book of Joel chapter 2. And I want you to catch this now because God is going to reveal some beautiful things to us so that he can help us to enter into an experience wherein we can truly be a revived people that can be reformed and counted. The Bible says in Joel chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse 23. The Bible says in Joel chapter 2 and verse 23, if you're there, please say amen. The Bible says in Joel chapter 2 and verse 23, it says, be glad then, ye children of Zion. And rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the what? Former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. Notice that the Bible is talking about pouring down something unto us, and it's called former and latter rain. Now here it is that this is the language used in verse 23, but now we're going to go ahead and look at verse 28 so that 28 can interpret verse 23. The Bible now goes on to say in verse 28, it says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my what? Spirit upon all flesh. So notice the Bible says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. So here it is that the Bible was giving a beautiful prophecy of how God's church was not always going to be void of power. God says that there was a time that was going to come upon which he was going to pour out his spirit. And remember, Jesus already told us when he pours out that spirit, we receive power. And that power enables us to be an effective witness. Now, let me say this as a little commercial. That witness God calls us to be is not simply a witness of words, but it's also a witness of lifestyle. How do we know that? Well, I want you to see how God used to witness back in the days in the book of Deuteronomy chapter six. Go to the book of Deuteronomy chapter six with me and I want you to see this. God always had this in mind when it came to witnessing. I'm so sorry, it's Deuteronomy chapter four. Deuteronomy chapter four, beautiful. And I want you to watch this. It's gonna, we're going to look at verses 5 and 6 of Deuteronomy chapter 4. This is the most powerful way to witness. And you're going to find that when we can learn to witness like this, I believe that you're going to see things change in your homes, things change in your school, things change in your workplace, and things changing in your churches and in your neighborhoods. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 4, right there in verse 5, and if you're there, say amen. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 5, it says, Behold, I've taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Now watch this, watch verse 6 carefully. It says, keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the what? In the sight of the nations which shall do what? Hear 
all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. According to the verses, question, were these nations witness to? Yes or no? According to the verses, ladies and gentlemen, listen, when a teacher asks a question, what do you think that teacher wants? An answer. So why do you keep looking at me when I ask you a question? What are you afraid of? I know I'm standing up here and I appear very tall, but you know, I'm just as short as you are once I get off this big, this big stage. You have nothing to be afraid of. If I'm asking a question, I just simply want to make sure you understand what we're talking about. How did, did witnessing take place to other nations according to Deuteronomy 4, 5, and 6? Yes or no? Oh my word. All right, well, let's go back to it. Let's look at it again. Verse 5. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations which shall hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Do we see a program on witnessing to other nations? Yes, we do. It is there. What's the program? How is it done? The first step, receive the instruction. The second step, do it. The third step, the nations will see you living those instructions. The fourth step, they will be willing to hear those instructions. The fifth step, they will say, surely you are a great and wise people. Notice that sight first, hearing second. Did you see that in the verse? First, the nation saw the people living their message. And then after that, they were willing more to hear their message. You know the great problem we have in witnessing today? We consistently tell people a message that we ourselves are not living. And then we wonder why the people look at us as a joke. And they begin to say, thanks for your message, but I'm not interested. God wants us to understand that the true concept of biblical witnessing is hear the message, live the message, then share the message. And when we do it in that order, it has a greater effect on the other nations that behold us. And so it is that God wants us to understand that this is the ideology behind witnessing. And hence we see that Jesus says, you need power to do that. And that power is called the Holy Spirit. Amen? So therefore we find then that the Bible shows us the way we can overcome this issue as it relates to 2 Timothy 3, individuals who have this form of godliness but deny the power thereof, is that we first need that dew of the Spirit of God that gives us power so that we can be revived. Now, I wonder if there is a book. Is there a book we can study that can help bring about revival? Do you think there's a book that we can study that can help bring about this revival? What book do you think that we can study that can help bring it about? What book? Honestly, if somebody would ask you, what book do you think can help bring about a kind of revival in our hearts where we can actually live the message so that we can more effectively teach it? Now, of course, we, were, we should certainly say the Bible. Amen. All right. Now, is there any specific book in the Bible that you think can do? What book in the Bible do you think can do? What do you say? Someone here to my left, what would you say? What book do you think in the Bible we could read that can help bring about a revival in our hearts? What book would you say? Okay, now I'm hearing a few. Let's see, let's see. What did you say, brother? Okay, so my brother here said Acts. One more. Habakkuk. Habakkuk? All right, beautiful. Now, to my right. I heard Acts and I heard Habakkuk. Someone here to my right. If there's a book in the Bible that we could read that can help bring about a revival experience, what book do you think that would be? Say again. Genesis. I heard Genesis. Tell me one more. Zechariah or Joel. Is that what I heard? All right, good. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm going to let you know. Generally, I would be in agreement with all of you. 
But if Jesus told us there was a specific book that if we studied it, it's designed to bring about a revival, do you think we should pay attention to what Jesus told us? All right, let me show you something that Jesus told us right here. You know, this is the testimony of Jesus, amen? And that's all right. Is, is, is it the testimony about Jesus or is it the testimony of Jesus? Amen. All right. Just want, I just want to make sure I'm in a seven-day Adventist group. So it's the testimony of Jesus. So I want you to notice this. It says, let us give more time to the study of the Bible. We do not understand the word as we should. The book of what? Revelation opens with an injunction to us to understand the instruction that it contains. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, God declares, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Now watch this. It goes on to say, watch this. When we as a people understand what this book means to us, there will be seen among us a great what? Revival. What book was that talking about? Revelation. It says, we do not understand fully the lessons that it teaches, notwithstanding the injunction given us to search and study it. You see, if we really want to experience revival that we might be counted, brothers and sisters, you got to go to the book that helps us behold Jesus, perhaps like no other book in the Bible does. And that is none other than the book of Revelation. Now, I'm going to unfold on this package even more as we progress throughout our studies. You see, God wants us to experience true revival. It cannot come except by the ministration of the Holy Spirit because he gives us power that we can live the word as well as proclaim the word. Are you following so far? Now, when we consider this, the Bible shows us something very special. Go back to the book of Acts chapter 2 now. We're going back to the book of Acts chapter 2. In Acts the second chapter, you will notice now the correlation between what we read in Joel chapter 2, and now we're going to look at Acts chapter 2. Notice what the Bible says in Acts the second chapter. And when you get there, please let me know by saying amen. Now, notice this. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 1. Jesus made the promise in Acts 1. He says that you shall receive power when the Spirit of God shall come upon you. Now notice what the Bible says in Acts chapter 2. It says, starting at verse 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, when this demonstration of the Spirit of God took place, the people began to think that the individuals who were speaking in these languages were drunk. How do we know this? Right here in verse 14. The Bible says, or rather verse 13, it says, Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Peter connected what took place on the day of Pentecost through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit as that former or early rain that fell according to Joel's prophecy. You following so far? All right, now watch this. This outpouring of the Spirit of God that enabled the children of Israel to be incredible, effective witnesses for God. This was the demonstration of that power of God that was promised. Now, brothers and sisters, do we need that power of God? Yes, because we have already been told our condition. Our condition is that we are traitors. We are heady. 
We are high-minded. We love pleasure more than we love God. That was the condition of God's church in the last days. So we need that power ourselves so we can get out of this form of godliness, denying the power, but we can become and experience true godliness as a result of a revival of true power. Amen? Therefore, the question is, what was it that prepared the disciples of old to receive the early reign so that we can understand what will prepare the disciples today to receive the latter rain before probation closes. Go to the book of Luke chapter 24. In Luke the 24th chapter, we will now discover a tremendous key that enables us to understand the power of the gospel and how God's people can be prepared to receive the outpouring of God's spirit that we may be revived. And I want you to see what the Bible shows us in Luke, the 24th chapter. And when you get there, please let me know by saying amen. The Bible says in Luke, the 24th chapter. Now, don't lose this, brothers and sisters. This is very key. I'm building up the case so that way when we get there, you will understand how we got here. The Bible shows in Luke, the 24th chapter, Jesus has already died, but he is now resurrected. There are men who are disappointed and they are unfortunately down because in their minds, Christ is dead and they thought he'd be alive. Jesus now shows up on the scene. And I want you to see what the Bible says as we consider verse 25. The Bible says, then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village, whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and brake and gave to them. And their eyes were open, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us what? The scriptures. Now, brothers and sisters, look at the very last few verses in the book of Luke and notice this experience and the connection of the timeline when it happened. Notice what it says in verse 50. And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this moment when Jesus opened up the scriptures to them, where he began to reveal what the Bible was teaching about himself, this was right before the event in the book of Acts that we just read. Right before it. Right before the Spirit of God poured out on Pentecost. Right before they received that power to be effective witnesses. This experience happened before then. So my question is, According to what we just read in Luke 24, what was it that had to take place to prepare the mind of the disciples to receive the power of God through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit through the early rain? What was it that had to take place? You know, I know how to look at you as much as you look at me. What was it, saints of God, that took place prior to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the early reign upon the disciples? What did Jesus find it necessary to do? He had to do what? He had to open up the scriptures. Look again at verse 27, saints. Look again at verse 27. You see, I really want to teach and I want to instruct tonight. Notice what the Bible says in verse 27. It says, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, 
he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, what? The things concerning himself. Look at verse 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms. What? Concerning me. You see, brothers and sisters, before they could receive the great outpouring of the Holy Spirit through the early reign, there was an absolute necessity for Jesus to open up the scriptures to them where they could behold him in the scripture. Once they were able to see Christ in the scriptures, their minds were better prepared to now go into the upper room where they could settle their differences and then the Spirit of God could be poured down upon them. That is the model on how the disciples received the early reign. You and I are getting ready to go through the final crisis. You and I are getting ready to embark upon soon the close of probation. And just like the disciples of old, we need to go through the experiences that are going to give us power so we can be effective witnesses to finish the work. The way that Jesus prepared the disciples of old is the way Jesus wants to prepare the disciples today. And the same way that before they could receive the early reign, they first had to go back to studying the Bible and beholding Christ in the scripture is the same way we must go back to studying the Bible and behold Christ in the scripture so we can be prepared to receive the latter rain. Are you following saints? And so it is. Watch this now. Watch. The theme of the Bible. You see, if I were to say we need to study the Bible, more that we can experience that true revival that's going to lead to true reformation so that we can be counted amongst God's saints so that we can finish the work. You know what you all would more than likely say? Brother Lemon, I already know that. But brothers and sisters, here's my question to you. Did the disciples study the Bible before Luke 24? Did the disciples study the Bible before Luke the 24th chapter? Yes? Did they understand the scriptures? So brothers and sisters, is it possible that we can read the Bible, we can go through the pages, but we can miss the whole point? You got to understand, saints of God, I'm on my knees praying and saying, Father, what do these people need here in the Philippines? What do my brothers and my sisters need? And God says they need to know how to search the scriptures. You know the greatest dearth that we have in seven-day Adventism today? Most people don't know how to study their Bibles. And I say this with all due respect for the writings of Ellen White. Do you know that most Seventh-day Adventists sooner know how to quote Ellen White before they know how to quote the Bible? Most Seventh-day Adventists do not even know how to substantiate their points from the Bible. If you were to go to somebody and say, teach me all these things that Ellen White says about health reform and show me it straight from the Bible. You know how many of us don't know how to do that? Somebody says, teach me the whole Mark of the Beast question and don't use one quote from Rome or Ellen White and show me it straight from the Bible. Do you know how many people don't know how to do that? We have become one of the most biblically illiterate generations of Seventh-day Adventism in existence. There was a time that Seventh-day Adventists were known to be people of the book. They knew their Bibles. They knew what they believed. And they can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the non-denominationals, or anybody. And they knew how to open up the Bible and explain truth. Today, you go to the average Seventh-day Adventist and say, do you believe this about health reform? Yes, I do. Here's your Bible. Please show me. And they don't know where to show it. And I'm going to let you know something right now. Listen to me. I've learned this, saints, as a health reformer. There's something that we must understand. The way the human mind works is that it doesn't like change. Is that right or wrong? People naturally and normally do not like change. Once people get into a routine of life, they don't like change. And therefore, when we teach something that's new to people, 
We have to show them it in such a way that they're going to say, why should I do this? Why should I change? And I've learned this. I've learned sometimes you can tell people all about health all you want. You know what people say? Look, people are going to die from something. So therefore, if I want to go ahead and eat this, or if I want to drink that, or if I want to live this certain kind of way, what does it matter? My mother did it, and she lived to be 100 years old. So you're telling me ABC statistics and all these other things, but she did it, and she lived to be 100. Or this person lived to be this way. And people present back all sorts of arguments, and that's why it is imperative that we don't just teach health, but we give the gospel of health. That's Councils on Diets and Foods, page 75. Ellen White says that when presenting health principles, she says that it must be connected to the third angel's message. Because that's when people can start taking it more seriously. Because otherwise, they're going to say, yeah, 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 thanks a lot. Yeah, I hear you. But they go right back to their old habits again. But when you start helping people, Sarah, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, this is designed to help prepare you for the second coming of Jesus. And if you don't do this, this can prepare you for hell. Now, all of a sudden, people start saying, wait a minute. You mean to tell me that this thing has a bearing on my salvation? Oh, yes, it does. You see, people are afraid to say that, but I'm not because I stand on the word of God. As long as the Bible backs me up, I can say it loud and clear. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I am letting you know right now, your eating and your drinking habits can affect your salvation. And I say it unapologetically because I stand on the word of God. I can show you from the Bible that if you and I don't get a control over our appetites, we will be lost. And therefore, it is God's desire for us to be saved. And therefore, he says, this is why I want you to learn how to eat and drink to my glory. This is why if any man strives for the mastery, he must be temperate in all things. It is only when we understand that, that that's when people will start taking these things a lot more seriously. But as long as we just simply give it and we, we, we make it, we put escape clauses in there, believe it or not, that's how people are. They're going to go ahead and walk away and just say, oh, well, I can just do what I want, when I want, how I want. And brothers and sisters, that's not the will of God. And so it is that you will find that the Lord is trying to help us understand that we need to be a people preparing to meet our God and there are things that are directly going to affect our salvation and Christ wants us to be saved. It is not enough that we're reading the Bible. The question is, are you understanding the Bible? You see, when the Bible was written, it had a central theme. And if you miss the theme, you miss everything. What is the theme of the Bible? Notice, what is the theme of the Bible? The theme of the Bible, we're told, the central theme of the Bible, the theme about which every other in the whole book clusters is the redemption plan, the restoration in the human soul of the image of God, the burden of how many books? Every book and how many passages? Every passage of the Bible is the unfolding of this wondrous theme. Man's uplifting, the power of God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, every time we study the Bible, it should have, it should have brought to light the redemption plan. It should have helped us see and understand something about the wonderful, miraculous, loving power of God and that redemption plan every time. But the problem is you want to know why many of us can study the Bible, but we're still so weak in faith. One of the reasons why many of us can study the Bible and we're still almost as ignorant as if we never opened our Bibles. One of the reasons why is because it is possible that we can get up every day and read our Bibles, but we don't see Christ in it. Go to the book of John chapter 5. Let me show you something. John the fifth chapter. John chapter 5. Watch this now. I want you to see this. This is why I always appreciate it. That's why I, I boy, my heart smiled yesterday when uh, 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 Dr. Rizzo, he was putting up on the screen and he showed how the cells in the body and it presented a cross inside of the body. Remember we saw that yesterday? Wasn't that beautiful? On how, I love it, brothers and sisters. That's the formula. That's the formula, that when we present the health principles, yes, we help them see it, but we also point them back to redemption. Help them see, did you know that redemption is even written in your DNA? 
That's powerful when you teach like that, brothers and sisters. This is what the world needs, because right now you got Dr. Oz and Dr. Phil and you got Rick Esselstein and you got Colin T. Campbell in the book, The China Study. All these people now are talking about plant based diets. But you know what the problem is? They don't recognize the God of heaven. So what they're doing is they're trying to teach six sinners how to become healthy, vibrant, strong sinners. Do you think that that's God's plan? Do you think God wants to help a sick sinner become a healthy, vibrant, strong sinner? Is that why God gave us a health message? Heaven forbid. When God gave us a health message, he wanted to teach sick sinners how to become healthy saints of God. And the only way that can happen is not through simply teaching health. That happens only through the gospel of health. That's why God wanted us to put those things together. And so it is that when we study the Bible, there was never a time that Jesus wanted us to just simply read letters. He wanted us to understand the theme in the letter. How do we know this? John chapter 5. The Bible says in John the 5th chapter right there in verse 39. And if you're there, say amen. amen. Jesus said, search the scriptures. For in them ye think ye have eternal life. For they are they which do what? testify of me every time you read the bible every time i read the bible i was supposed to learn something about the character of god i was supposed to see the image of jesus christ even when we study the law of god you know that god raised up the seventh day adventist church so that we can bring people back to a harmony with god's law amen let me show you something about God's law. Go to the book of Romans chapter 7. Watch this. We're going to study this tonight. Because if you can leave here understanding what I'm sharing with you tonight, your life's going to change. I'm serious. Your life's going to change. It hurts me when I see so many Seventh-day Adventists. We are a very privileged denomination of people. We have more information. We have more truth than any other denominated body on planet Earth. If you got a problem in your home, we have the Bible and Adventist home. You have a problem with your child, we have the Bible and child guidance. You have a problem with your teenager, we have the Bible and messages to young people. You have a problem in your church, we have the Bible and the testimonies to the church, volumes one through nine. You have a problem with your health, we have the Bible and councils on diets and foods, medical ministry, ministry of healing, councils on health. You have a problem with finances, we have the Bible and councils on stewardship. You have a problem with the Bible, we have the Bible plus the Conflict of the Ages series. We are rich. There is no reason that God's remnant should be suffering as much as we're suffering. But the, what, the way that the devil has gotten us is he says, go ahead and read the books, just miss the theme. That's what Satan wants, brothers and sisters. Read the books, but miss the theme. Because if you miss the theme, you miss everything. Let me show you what I mean. Go to the book of Romans chapter 7. In Romans the 7th chapter, notice what the Bible says now. The Bible says in Romans chapter 7, talking about that law of God. The Bible says in Romans chapter 7, right there in verse 12. Notice what the Bible says, talking about the law of God, the Ten Commandments. It says, wherefore, the law is what? holy and the commandment what holy and just and good now when the bible talks about the law of god it it, it it actually referred to the law of god as holy and what else just and what else good now watch this the first thing that the verse said is that the law is what holy now you compare that with first peter 1 15 and 16. Notice what the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. The, the first description of the law of God that we read in Romans 7 and verse 12 is that it is holy. Now notice what the Bible says as we look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. Watch this. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, let's notice what the Bible says. And when you get there, please say amen. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, it says, But as he which hath called you is holy, holy so be ye holy in all manner of conversation because it is written be ye holy for what i am holy so here it is that in the law of god in romans 7 12 the bible says the law is holy but here it is in first peter 1 15 and 16 we find that god is holy the second thing on the list is that it said the law is 
just. Is that right? Go to the book of Deuteronomy, the 32nd chapter now. In Deuteronomy, the 32nd chapter, notice what the Bible says here. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, notice what the Bible says as we consider Deuteronomy 32 and verse 4. The Bible says the law is holy. The Bible says God is holy. The Bible says the law is just. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 4. If you're there, say amen. The Bible says he is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. A God of truth without iniquity. Just and right is he. So here it is that the Bible says the law is holy. And the Bible says God is holy. The Bible says the law is just. The Bible says God is just. But Romans seven twelve also said that the law is good. Go to Matthew 19. In Matthew the 19th chapter, notice what the Bible says. In Matthew chapter 19, notice what the scripture says. Matthew the 19th chapter now. And now we're going to go ahead and look at verses 16 and 17. Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 and 17. When you get there, let me know by saying amen. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 and 17, it says, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is who? God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Now, brothers and sisters, I want you to capture this. Here it is that the Bible says the law is holy and God is holy. Then the Bible said the law is just and we saw that God is just. Then we saw that the law is good and then we saw that God is Good. So therefore, when we look at the law of God, what is it that every time should be revealed in the law of God? There should, we should see what revealed? His character. Now, brothers and sisters, let's be honest, saints of God. How many times do we find ourselves presenting the law of God as simply rules upon which God says, do this or die? And many a times, people do not see the character of God from that law that we are called to present to them. This is why, brothers and sisters, many a times, we ourselves have no connection between ourselves and God because many a times we look at his commandments. Think about it. How many times we, we, we call ourselves a group of Sabbath-keeping people, but do you know that the majority of us, we don't even keep Sabbath? Think about it. Isaiah 58, 13 and 14 says that we should not even speak our own words. How many times do we come together on Sabbath and we make jokes that have nothing to do with God and his truth? How many times do we meet on Sabbath and we begin to talk about what happened during the week and we're talking about a whole bunch of stuff that is completely secular and does not draw our minds or recommend us to Jesus Christ? How many times do we find ourselves in situations, in conditions where we see ourselves going through the motions and we find ourselves, brothers and sisters, not keeping our minds stayed on God, yet we call ourselves Sabbath keepers. God wants us to search our hearts. God wants us to check ourselves and to realize that we are professing something that we ourselves have not entered into the experience. And this is what the Lord wants to do. He wants to reveal the scripture to us, but he wants to do it in a way where we can behold Christ, his character, his love and his truth in such a way that it will help us to appreciate the scriptures. Let me tell you something. I remember going to one of our schools one of our schools. This school was different from any other Seventh-day Adventist school that I went to before in my life. This school, brothers and sisters, all of the girls in the school wore long flowing skirts. They didn't reveal their legs and their thigh and their backside and their cleavage. They dressed like saints of God. The young men, you always saw them in the morning reading their Bibles. I mean, early in the morning, the young men were reading their Bibles. 
One day we had to have breakfast and the teacher said it is time for breakfast. And when all, almost in marching order, when the teacher said it was time for breakfast, all the students kicked their chair back and kneeled down in the cafeteria and everybody kneeled down before God and gave thanks for the food that they were about to eat. When it was time to eat, we went down the potluck and you never had to ask, is there eggs in this? Is there milk in this? Is there chocolate in this? Is there vinegar in this? No question. Everything was complete health reform. When I went to the classes, I listened to some of the teachers teach. And when the teachers were teaching, they were teaching deep, present truths. Daniel, Revelation, Sanctuary, Victory Over Sin, The Nature of Christ, all the subjects that are pertinent to us as a people today. Now, when I went to the school, I'm telling you the truth, I was thoroughly impressed. I said, I have not been to a Seventh-day Adventist school like this in a very long time. I was thoroughly impressed. And they invited me to be the guest speaker. Now, what happened was I began to speak and it was on a Friday night. And I remember that I began to preach the word. And as I was preaching the gospel and telling the truth as it is in Jesus and all of these things at the conclusion of the message, I said to the people, I said, now I'm going to stay here. If there's anybody who needs special prayer, I said, come meet me over here on the side. Brothers and sisters, 90 people stayed back for prayer. Here's what got me. Of the 90 people that came up from prayer for prayer, you're talking about men, women, and children. Of the 90 people that came up for prayer, perhaps 80 of them came up with this same testimony. I don't know God. I don't know God. And I thought to myself, they dress right, they eat right, they demonstrate reverence on their knees. They are surrounded by present truth teachings. Oh, by the way, they were in the country, growing their own food. How is it that they could, on the outside, do so much right? And then come to me and say, I don't know God. I don't know God. Brothers and sisters, what I'm saying to you is that you and I can do a lot of the mechanics and the external actions that will wow and impress the majority of people that are beholding us while in our hearts, we are void of the presence and power of God. And many of us have what's called skeletons in our closets, darling sins, secret sins that we are overcome by on a regular basis. And brothers and sisters, one of the key reasons why this happens is because in our studies, we are not beholding the one that has the power to transform. And then when we do evangelism, the same cold, lifeless ceremonial worship that we have, we introduce it to the non-Adventist community and we wonder why they leave our churches shortly after baptism. When you study the law of God, we should be able to see the character of God. When you study the Bible, you should be able to see the character of God. Jesus, when he taught the scriptures to bring about a revival, he didn't just teach them the words of Moses, the words of David and the psalmist. He showed them all of those statements concerning himself. And the question is, when you study the law of God, what do you see? When you read your Bibles, what do you see? Do you just see a bunch of rules and a bunch of do's and don'ts or else? Or do you see more than that? You see, look at this. When we think about God's character, remember the law of God reveals God's character. Can I show you an attribute of God's character that is one of the chief things that the law of God reveals? Notice this. 
When you look at 2 Samuel 24, 14, the Bible says, And David said to Gad, I am in a great strait. Let us fall now into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. And let me not fall into the hand of man. In Psalms 86 and verse 5, For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy to all them that call on you. Psalms 145, 9, The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. Luke 6, 36, Be you therefore merciful as your father also is merciful. Ephesians 2, 4, But God who is rich in mercy for his great love which he, with, with which he loved us. Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. 1 Peter 1, 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. When we see the character of God, what is the chief attribute of God's character that we behold? that he is mercy, that he is a merciful God. Now watch this. When we look at that, the question is, when you and I study the word of God, even when we look at the law of God, the question is, do you behold God's mercy? Do you demonstrate that in your proclamations? As an example, when I think about the problems in our world today, I think we would have to be deaf, dumb, and blind to say that we don't have problems. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to show you a way to look at the law of God that perhaps you have never looked at it like this before. When I think about the problems in our world today, I want to give you an example. I think about adultery. Is that a real problem in our world today? Oh, yes. How about sexually transmitted diseases? Is that a real problem in our world today? Oh, yes, it is. How about children growing up without fathers? Is that a real problem in our world today? Yes, it is. How about homicides over dating issues? Some guy kills another guy because he was talking to his girlfriend or messing around with his woman and so on. Do, are these things real? Does this happen today? Does this happen in the Philippines or is it just America? Oh, yes, it happens here too. How about rape? Is that a real issue and a real problem in our world today? Yes. How about child molestation? Is that a real issue? How about child prostitution? Is that a real issue? Yes. How about homosexuality? Is that a real issue? Yes. How about pornography? Is that a real issue? Now, brothers and sisters, I want you to think about this. These are real problems in our world today. These are problems that our government cannot solve and that many individuals with good intentions and organizations cannot solve. But do you know one of the easiest and simplest ways to solve all of these problems in one shot? You know how you do it? You let everybody know, thou shalt not commit adultery. Do you know that if individuals understood this seventh commandment, we would understand that it was not a punishing statement coming from God. It was actually a statement of mercy and blessing and preservation. You see, when an individual understands thou shalt not commit adultery, do you know that if we were to follow that simple commandment, there'd be no adultery today. If we were to follow that simple commandment, there'd be no sexually transmitted diseases today. If we followed that simple commandment, there'd be no child molestation, child prostitution, there'd be no pornography, there'd be no homosexuality, there'd be no masturbation or self-abuse. All of these things would be completely eliminated from our earth if people simply understood, thou shalt not commit adultery. When God gave this commandment, he was not giving it to try to punish people. He was trying to say that this is a demonstration of my mercy. This is a demonstration of my love. This is one of the ways I'm trying to show you how I can keep you and your home and your communities happy. But very rarely do we present this commandment in this light. Very rarely. We love to just simply tell people, don't do it. And if you do it, you sin, and sin is a transgression of the law, and the wages of sin is death. How about this one? Problems in our world today. 
False worship, is that a major problem in our world today? Yes. How about materialism, is that a problem in our world today? Yes. How about religious wars, is that a problem in our world today? How about religious killings, is that a problem in our world today? Yes, it is. How about gluttony, is that a problem in our world today? Yes, it is. How about slavery to fashion, is that a problem in our world today? Do you know that God said, I have a solution that can help individuals overcome false worship, materialism, religious wars, religious killings, gluttony, slavery to fashion, and the list goes on. Do you know what God's solution was to this problem? God said, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Do you know that if there were no other gods, there'd be no false worship? If everybody honored the true and living God and knew of him and his love and his grace and his power, there wouldn't be the slaves to fashion. There wouldn't be the glutton where people, as a Philippians 3 and verse 18 says, where the people make their bellies their gods. There wouldn't be any of these things that would exist if people properly understood, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now, somebody says, Brother Lemon, why are you telling us all these things? What is the point? You see, people today, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I, I'm so thankful because I want to break this cycle. We always believe that because we're living in the last days, we need to just consistently slap people with the belt of present truth and consistently show people all of their sinfulness. Brothers and sisters, listen to me. While I definitely believe that we must understand where we are in time and we must understand that we need an experience of victory over sin, just simply knowing you're a sinner is not going to give you victory over sin. Somebody has to point you to a God of mercy. In the most holy place, yes, there's a law of God, but praise God, there's a mercy seat above it. And we are not veering away from present truth when we focus on the mercy of God. Because you know what the last I checked? Go to the book of Romans chapter 2. We're preparing to close. Go to Romans chapter 2. The last that I checked, do you know something that can bring people to an experience of true repentance? Go to the book of Romans chapter 2. Notice what the Bible says. The Bible says in Romans, the second chapter, what is it that's going to bring the people to true repentance? You see, we think, oh, all we got to do is just tell people how wicked they are. Show them how sinful they are. Show them that time is almost finished and they're running out. And the list goes on. And we think we do that in the absence of demonstrating God's love, mercy, and grace. And we think that for some reason people are going to get it right. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. That'll never get a man right. Not that by and of itself. Notice what the Bible clearly says leads people to true repentance. The Bible says in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4, it says, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. It is not just simply showing everybody that they're wicked and messed up that's supposedly going to get them right. Brothers and sisters, we have to understand, we have to help the people see the goodness of God. We must see the goodness of God when we read Scripture. We must see the character of God when we study the Word of God. We must see the character of God when we study that law of God. And it is more that we behold this, that it creates a love in our hearts for Jesus. We were told by the prophet, the law of Ten Commandments is not to be looked upon as much from the prohibitory side as from the what side? Mercy side. I'm following God's instructions tonight. God does not want us to just simply point out the law of God just from its prohibitions. Don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, or else, or else, or else, or else. The testimony of Jesus says the law of Ten Commandments is not to be looked upon as much from the prohibitory side as from the mercy side. Its prohibitions are the sure guarantee of happiness in obedience. You know, sometimes people don't even understand. Do you know why Jesus gives the commands that he gives in the Bible? Do you even know why Jesus does it? Go to the book of John, the 15th chapter. I want you to see this about your Savior. Because if you don't, I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, you're going to be lost. 
It is imperative that we see this about Jesus. Go to the book of John, the 15th chapter. Watch this. Why does Jesus even give us the commands that he gives? John, the 15th chapter. Notice what the Bible says. John chapter 15. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In John 15, look at what it says right there in verse 11. It says, these things have I spoken unto you. All these commands, all these instructions. Jesus says, these things have I spoken unto you that my what? Joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Do you know what a person is like when their joy is full? They're joyful. They're joyful. You know what many of us look like? A bunch of sad ventists. Literally by our very countenance, many of us look like, we, we almost have a look like we warn people, don't join this religion, you might end up like me. Don't get me wrong, saints of God. God is not calling us to be frivolous. God is not calling us to be lax. We are living in the most solemn time in earth's history. We are living in the anti-typical day of atonement. But if we are to interpret that to mean that we must walk around with bent brow and sad countenance, brothers and sisters, you're a fanatic. God has never called us to be that. We are called to have a peace that passes all understanding. A joy that is unspeakable. But it only comes when we can behold Christ in the chapter. It only comes when we can see God in the law and not just see them as a bunch of external do's and don'ts or else. And so we finish with the quote, the law of 10 commandments is not to be looked upon as much from the prohibitory side as from the mercy side. Its prohibitions are the sure guarantee of happiness in obedience. As received in Christ, it works in us the purity of character that will bring joy to us through eternal ages. Are you reading the quote, saints? My heart is burdened for what I see in Adventism. Most people who claim to believe present truth don't even understand present truth. They think present truth is beating all the apostates over the head and showing them their wickedness on a regular basis, but never do we consider, man, we need to show them the goodness of God. We need to demonstrate that mercy of God. We need to help them see that character of God. We just want to simply tell them that the, the, that, that the spiritual formation in the church is error. And brothers and sisters, it is. We want to show them that all of the worldly policy that we have allowed to come into our conferences and the list goes on is corrupting our churches. And it's true. But brothers and sisters, sooner or later, somebody has to answer the question, what solves the problem? Because if you don't have an inspired solution to the inspired problem, then you're part of the problem. And so it is that we, if we can see it, it says to the obedient, it is a wall of protection. We behold in it the goodness of God, who by revealing to men the immutable principle of righteousness, seeks to shield them from the evils that result from transgression. This is what Jesus wants us to see when we study the word of God. And so I close in the book of Isaiah chapter 6. In Isaiah, the sixth chapter, we find a very solemn lesson. In Isaiah, the sixth chapter, you will notice if you carefully study the book of Isaiah, if you carefully study the book of Isaiah, you would find that in Isaiah chapters 1 through 5, Isaiah goes to Israel and he woes them. He tells Israel, woe unto you, woe unto you, woe unto you, woe unto you. In fact, if you study Isaiah, uh, uh, the books of Isaiah chapters 1 through 5, you will find that eight times between chapter 1 and chapter 5, Isaiah says woe to Israel for their various sinfulness. 
But Isaiah chapter 6 gives us a powerful lesson. And the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 6, starting at verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his faith, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. And then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. And then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And then said I, Here am I, send me. Brothers and sisters, when you think of Isaiah, you think of a warrior. Isaiah was one who woed Israel. He pointed out their sins. He showed them their errors. He showed them the corrupt actions that they have allowed to creep into the church and into their lives. And he woed them and woed them. But it was in Isaiah 6 that God now gives Isaiah a vision of himself. Isaiah beholds God. And as Isaiah beholds God in his purity, in his majesty, in his kingly authority, all of a sudden, Isaiah is no longer simply woeing Israel, but now Isaiah says, woe is me. And he realizes, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And brothers and sisters, while Isaiah was calling all of their sins by their right name, what Isaiah did not realize is that he had sins on himself that were yet to be confessed. Verse 7 says his iniquity was taken away. It was at that moment his iniquity was taken away, which means that before that moment, his iniquity was upon him. Can you imagine that? We're pulling the beam out of everybody else's eye when we have a plank in our own. And so it is that God begins to minister to us and help us see that if we are ever going to experience that power that can help us be truly revived and finish the work, the first thing Jesus did with the disciples of old was he gave them a study of the scripture. But the new dynamic was that they had to behold Christ in the scripture. And I leave this instruction with you. What's the instruction? Here's your instruction. Going past all this. Specific things to look for in your devotional time. You see, all of you have devotion right now. I have no doubt about that. All of us, I'm sure, are reading our Bibles and we're looking for different things and so on. But I want to give you these gems. I believe if you have these gems, they're going to be very helpful to you as it relates to having a greater, more successful devotion that by the grace of God will lead you to behold Jesus and that by beholding you become truly changed into the same image. In one way only can a true knowledge of self be obtained. We must behold Christ. It is ignorance of him that makes men so uplifted in their own righteousness. When we contemplate his what? Purity and what else? Excellence. We shall see our own weakness and poverty and defects as they really are. We shall see ourselves lost and hopeless, clad in garments of self-righteousness like every other sinner. We shall see that if we are ever saved, it will not be through our own goodness, but through God's infinite grace. Point number one is tomorrow morning when you get up for devotion, the two specific things you want to look for in your reading is when you read whatever you read, you are going to ask God to reveal his purity and his excellence to you in the reading. You want to be able to write it down and to write back to yourself, 
Here is what I have learned about the purity and the excellence of Christ in the reading that I did this morning. Because we're promised that if we see his purity and excellence, what's the promise? We shall see our own weakness and poverty and defects as they really are. What's the next promise? Those who experience the sanctification of the Bible will manifest a spirit of humility. Like Moses, they have had a view of the awful majesty of holiness and they, are, and they see their own unworthiness in contrast with the purity and exalted perfection of the infinite one. Again, when you do your reading, the things that you are asking God to help you see is God's majesty and holiness in the reading. These are the things you're asking God for in your devotional time. Lord, help me to behold your purity, your excellence. Help me to behold your majesty and holiness. And finally, our last slide. There can be no self-exaltation, no boastful claim to freedom from sin on the part of those who walk in the shadow of Calvary's cross. They feel that it was their sin which caused the agony that broke the heart of the Son of God. And this thought will lead them to self-abasement. What thought? It was their sins which caused the agony that broke the heart of the Son of God. That thought, we are promised, will lead them to self-abasement. Those who live nearest to Jesus discern most clearly the frailty and sinfulness of humanity, and their only hope is in the merit of a crucified and risen Savior. Brothers and sisters, these are the things that you want to look for. Now, I'm not talking from a theory. I'm speaking from experience. I've been doing this for years now. Every devotion that I have with Jesus, when I get up in the morning, I am asking God, help me to behold your purity. Help me to see your excellence. Help me to see your majesty. Help me to behold your holiness. Help me to see that it was my sins that broke your heart and caused you agony. And yet you were still willing to forgive me and count me amongst the beloved. It was through this brothers and sisters that I found a revival that took place in my own heart. And this revival has stuck brothers and sisters. And guess what? It gets sweeter as the days go by. I believe Seventh-day Adventists are in a crisis. We have looked so much to the law. We have looked so much to the stern rebukes. We have looked so heavily upon the things that are wrong that it is almost impossible to see the things that are right and to rejoice in it and to thank God for it and to walk in its power. And brothers and sisters, you don't want to find yourself counted amongst those. You see, Seventh-day Adventism has two extremes. They have Pharisee and Sadducee. The Sadducees, oh, they were the liberals. The Sadducees were the ones painting themselves up with the makeup, putting on the earrings, the ones that were bringing in all the foul music and everything else. The Sadducees were the liberals and Jesus couldn't save them in that condition. But the Pharisees, they were the sticklers for the law. The Pharisees were the ones that thought that they were the keepers and the guardians of present truth. They thought that they were the best law keepers in the world, but they were fanatics. They were cold. And Jesus says he knew that the love of the Father was not in their hearts. Jesus cannot save Pharisee nor Sadducee. But he can save sinners that recognize a need for God's saving grace, that recognize his mercy, his love, and his pardon. And brothers and sisters, that's what's available to us tonight. And so it is tonight if you know that perhaps you've been a Sadducee. Maybe some of, some of you have been a Sadducee. You've been there and you've been very liberal. You've taken the principles and the truths of God's word that he has given to the remnant church and now we trample upon it. I've meet, I meet people like that all the time. People say, oh, I once believed in the spirit of prophecy. I once believed in present truth, but now I just think that all we gotta do is love Jesus. Brothers and sisters, that's one class. But then there's the other class. 
The other class who believes that there's such incredible law keeping and law abiding children of God that they have gotten to a point that when they study the word of God, it does nothing between their heart and their savior. And their worship is cold, lifeless, and ceremonial. And brothers and sisters, Jesus does not want us to be either Sadducee or Pharisee. He wants us to be Christians in our hearts. And so tonight, if you realize, you know what, I've been a Sadducee or tonight you say, you know what, I realize I've been a Pharisee and tonight you want to relinquish that Sadducee or Pharisaism and you want to say, Lord, teach me to be a Christian in my heart. Show me how I can read your words of truth and behold you and your character in it that by your grace, I can finally become changed. If that's your desire tonight, if you're saying, Lord, I've been a Sadducee, Lord, I've been a Pharisee, but tonight, please help me to be a Christian in my heart. Help me to walk the balance of the line. Help me to behold that central theme in every book, in every passage that I will never read the Bible the same. I will be on a quest to find your character in everything that I read. And as I behold you, please help me to become changed. If that's your determination tonight, would you stand with me, please? You're standing tonight, you're saying, yes, that's me. I've been a, Phad a Pharisee, I've been a Sadducee, but by your grace tonight, I want to be a Christian in my heart. I want to be a Christian in my heart. I want to look carefully at your word and I want your word to guide me and I want to behold you. And brothers and sisters, I believe that this is an imperative experience that we can be revived so that by the grace of God, we can be counted. And so as you stand, know that Jesus stands with you. Understand that he's on your side. Understand that he wants to save you, saints. And he's determined to make sure you're coming home with him. Just cooperate with him. Remember the lessons we learned. Don't ever study the Bible the same as we did before, but go back and dig deeper and dig deeper and look for the gem of the character of the lovely image of Jesus Christ. And you shall seek and you will find. Let us close with a word of prayer as we go before the Lord at this time. Our loving Father, we are so grateful that you have taught us the truth as it is in Jesus Christ. Father, these feeble efforts have been made to help draw your people to see their need, that when we study and when we read your words, that we are to behold your character within it, to see that lovely redemption plan, so that by your grace, dear God, we can overcome as Christ overcame. And as you did this with the disciples of old and it prepared them for the upper room experience where they received the early rain. Father, help us that in this study practice, may it bring us to an upper room experience that will prepare us for the latter rain, that we may finish the work in this generation. And we thank you for hearing this prayer, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.